Hi. Yesterday in the fennel shed, we did a log cabin lasagna workshop, and all the girls asked me to put it together on foam so that they could refer back to it. So this is for you, Maureen, and Iris, and Phil, and who's the fourth person? I'll remember in a minute. These are the log cabin blocks. We've made thousands upon thousands of log cabin blocks over the years and we've discovered every problem there is along the way. We've devised a thing called log cabin lasagna. Not about how they're made, but it's about how they're cut. And this is what I'm going to show you, is how we cut the method called log cabin lasagna. We start with the strips that are the centre. And the centrepiece strips need to be one and a half inches wide. And for the purposes of this, I need to so I'm going to cut my two centre strips. If you're cutting a short length, use a short ruler. Only use your long ruler if you really need to, because you have more control on the short ruler. And that's my two centres. Two centres. And they are ready to go. I'm going to move those a little bit further out of the way because my white fabric comes next. And I'm going to cut all the pieces that I need for the white. The first piece is one and a half, then two and a half, then three and a half, then four and a half, then five and a half, and six and a half. And in all cases, the pieces will be those sizes that I've just listed by at least 21 inches wide. So here's my white fabric. And again, I'm going to fold it over double because I have more control over my cutting there. And line it up on the board ready to cut. I've got two layers because I need two of each size. And cut in. Rosemary. Sorry, Rosemary. How could I have forgotten? I was full of Maureen and Rosemary. So, one and a half, two and a half, three and a half, four and a half, one and a half, two and a half, three and a half, four and a half, five and a half, six and a half. Okay, that's my legs in that order. Now, my darks in this case aren't very dark. My darks are like the combination over here. I've got pink, I've got my white background, and I've got my shades of mint green, and I've got deep pinks, and I've got reds. We wouldn't always have used pinks and reds together, but like blue and green, we were afraid of them. But together they are lovely. So I have six pieces of fabric here. They are all ten and a half inches top to bottom by half the width of the fabric with the selvage still in place. The se I keep my selvage in because we cut all of the logs, all of the elms, parallel to selvage. That way there's no stretch. This way there's an awful lot of stretch and traditionally we were taught to cut our log cabin logs across the weave of the cloth and the bigger the block got the more stretch there was, the more unwieldy it became, the more irregular they became and we kept having to tidy them up, trim them, cut them back 
This way, everything is pre-cut, precision cut before you start. So I am going to cut these fabrics in three groups of two. So my first pairing, the pieces, remember, have to be a minimum of ten and a quarter to ten and a half inches top to bottom by the half width, which is roughly twenty one and a half, twenty two inches of usable fabric. And from these, the first pair of fabrics I'm going to cut the shortest and the longest, which is a two and a half and a seven and a half when it comes to the darks. In the second set of fabrics I'm going to cut the second and the second last, which is a three and a half and a six and a half. And from the third pair of fabrics, I'm going to cut the two middle ones, which is a four and a half and a five and a half. And if you add those sums together, they all come to ten inches. So we've got two and a half and seven and a half, ten inches. We've got three and a half and six and a half, ten inches. And we've got four and a half and five and a half, which is ten inches. And as I cut, you'll see that this uh, almost eliminates waste completely. So I'm cutting these guys too trim straight first. Two and a half. Seven and a half. The shortest and the longest. And then the next, which is the three and a half and the six and a half. pair the middle ones you can cut these pieces from your own fat quarters, any fat quarters that you have or partial fat quarters, as long as they are the full width of the fat quarter, preferably with the selvage still in place along one side, because that is your guideline as to the way the fabric is woven. Remember always we are going to be cutting our logs parallel to selvage for no stretch. And this one is three and a half and four and a half? No, four and a half and five and a half. Two, three, four and a half. That's these two middle guys, four and a half and five and a half. We've done two and three and we've done six and seven. So this is four and a half. One, two, three, four, five. Five and a half. So as you can see, the waste isn't an awful lot. Now we have cut centers, all the lights, and all the contrasts or darks. Right, now we have all the elements that we need cut and ready to go. I'm going to start the next phase. And purely for handiness, we sew the centers onto the first lights before I cut. This is to make life an awful lot easier because, to my way of thinking, sewing little squares, one and a half inches squares, to each other is very monotonous and very fiddly. So, this sews them all together in groups. 
shape like a banana and it will never lie flat and it will never be right. So take a little time before you start with a few bits of scrap fabric and adjust your tension if you need to. Your stitch size should be around the two and a half inch, not the 2.5 rather stitch size on your machine, not two and a half inch. <laughs> And this is effectively sewing the centers onto the first right for at least 24 blocks. So this is taking the place of me sitting down and lifting 24 times and matching up and pairing two tiny squares, taking them to the sewing machine and feeding them through. Instead we do it this way. This is a little scrap of fabric that I always keep at the ready. And as I trim, I have no spare threads lying on the floor or sticking to me. To get the ironing right, put this on your ironing board, light side down. Don't use steam and iron sideways on pushing that upper fabric, the darker one, back away from the side of the iron all the time. You don't iron it the way you would iron the sleeve of the shirt because that way you will get a little fold along the edge of the cloth and that will distort the size. So you want to be sewing probably pressing well away from yourself and then turn it over and then you can give it a second press from the other side. Light side on the bottom, lift up the top, press away from yourself. You're not pulling it, but you're not allowing there to be a little pin tuck or a fold there along the press line either. So once you have that stitched, you have all the elements ready to start assembling your lasagna and cutting the portions. This is where the fun work starts. We have all our lights here. We have all our contrasts or darks here. We have our centers here. So, for each dish, and this dish will give us 12 blocks or 12 portions, we start with our bottom layer. And the bottom layer is the biggest of the darks, which is, just to check, seven and a half inch. And I set that onto my board. Can that all be seen there? No. The start visible. If I move the board, you can see the start. You can see the start. You can see what they have in it. Yeah. Not this. No. And I'll keep on moving the board. This. Yeah. Okay. For the purposes of this, I'm starting on the 12 inch line. But usually if you're working on a standard board, you would use your zero line as your baseline. This is my baseline. And I want the top edge of the fabric be run along one of the horizontal lines on the board as straight as I can make it. So that's the biggest one. The next one is a 
six and a half. And I put these on the board. I got one mixed up. Right side down. It's really a cosmetic thing. It means that when I fold them to store them, I can see what fabric is in each group. So that's right side down. Seven and a half, six and a half, five and a half. Four and a half. Three and a half. And two and a half. And this is like a set of stairs. The raw edge is here, underneath my baseline, whatever your baseline is. In this case, it's the 12 inch line. On most boards, you would choose the zero line, but I'm leaving it where you can see it. This is exactly the same group of sizes again the two and a half, three and a half, four and a half, five and a half, six and a half, all ready for my second group. And because these are all different, those are all different. Then into the mix goes, very like cooking, into the mix goes the ready prepared centre one which is the centre plus the first light and it goes in here face down. Or face up. Maybe we'll put them face up. Yeah, try this out. Face up probably would be better for these. Then we take our lights in the opposite order. We started with the darks, the biggest one first, and worked our way up to the lights, climbing up the stairs. Then we're going to start with the smallest, which was the one and a half, which is attached to the centre. It's already in place. Then the two and a half. Then three and a half. Then Five and a half. And six and a half. Because the largest light is six and a half. It's never as long as the largest or the longest dark or contrast. It's the longest fella in the block. That's seven and a half. The largest light is six and a half. So in effect we have two staircases, one going up and one going down, meeting each other. So while we have six layers here, we've got six layers here. So it means that the ruler can sit comfortably on that. If I had all the depth at one end and just one shallow end, the ruler would rock and I wouldn't be able to cut it efficiently. Now I left something heavy, which in case this gave me my 2013 diary, but you can use anything you like. Set that on one end so that it doesn't move as you cut, because as you work your way across the stack, they can move and you don't want them to, to start to move. So our zero line, effectively my zero line, remember, was a 12. Trim. That's our waist. We have all of the elements for this now in this stack. So every time I take a slice that is one and a half inches wide, I have all of these components in that slice. The quilt that we plan to make is a child's quilt. We're going to put 48 blocks in it. Eight rows of six. It'll leave us plenty of scope as to what we can do. The centre of the quilt will be 42 inches wide by 56 inches long. And then we'll add borders. And we'll show you that being assembled next week. Once we have the blocks made. So here I am taking slices. One and a half inch wide. Make sure your cutting table is at a height that is comfortable for your height. If it's too low, 
you'll end up with a very sore back. If it's too high, you won't have enough control over your blade and your cutter. You'll be up on tippy toes and you won't be able to really have enough strength and control. And I'm going to move my board along and move the weight along. do this when you aren't going to be interrupted, when you don't have a phone or I wouldn't even have radio, certainly not talk radio on in the background and you concentrate because you want to get this one and a half inches right all the way along. So I've got two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. That's the maximum that you'll get from this work. Sometimes it might only be twelve, sometimes it'll be thirteen. It depends on how wide your salvage is where to begin with. But that is the sum total of my waist to date for making 14 plus 14, 28 blocks, half the quilt, that's the waist. Now, and this is the nice bit, off the kitchen, get a little lunch box, fold these over and set them into your lunch box. Away. And if you put them away for a year and a day and you don't touch them, when you come back they'll still be sitting like that, ready for you to sew them. And you won't be sitting and go, what did I cut those for? What were they about? Because within each one of those, what you have got is, you just separate them out so that you can see you've got your centre. Your first light, then your second light, your first dark, your second dark, your third light, your fourth, third, and fourth dark, and fifth, and sixth, and fifth. Everything that you need to make one of those is in that portion. Three cut, ready to go. And I'm going to sew two of them so that you can see how easy they are to sew. You can now sit and sew these by hand, or you can take them back to the machine and sew them. And remember, we have another complete set here, ready to cut. And I like to sew these two at a time. Sewing them two at a time is the easiest and quickest thing to do. Uh, and I just go from the first to the second and back again. So I start off with my first light and centre and stitch them on to the second. And then I do the same. And always keep the one that has the seams in it uppermost. Your new piece of fabric that you're adding on doesn't have any seams in it, so you don't have to worry what direction the seams are going to be falling. You do need to worry what direction these are, so keep them uppermost so that you can keep an eye on them. This is the first, this is the second, keep going clockwise, this is the third. Remember, you want to cover in sequence the four sides of your centre. And I 
I just leave a little chain in between the layers. You can stop and iron if you find it's a help to iron after every addition. A lot of people do. I like to iron possibly after every circuit. But finger pressing, when you're using good cottons, finger pressing is just fine. And then I'll just iron the completed blocks. Where you can, press your light behind your dark. And this is where, if your seam allowance isn't matching up here now, it means if your the new piece that you're adding in isn't matching at the two ends, it means your seam allowances here are either too thick or too thin. So you go and adjust them straight away. Your logs, your elements are going to tell you if you've got your seam allowance wrong. And your seam allowance should always be a quarter inch. And once you get to this stage, where you've one circuit completed, you are always going to be adding your new fabric onto the side where you have to cross two seams. And I'm crossing two seams. And I'll show you what I mean by that. I have one circuit complete there. And if I wish to, I can bring it to the iron and iron it. It does make it easier to continue on with. If I add a piece on here, I've only got one seam. If I add a piece on here, I have no seam at all. If I add a piece on here, I'm only crossing one seam. So the place that I should be is here, where I'm crossing two seams. And because the middle part of this is light, I should be adding on a light. If the middle section was a dark or a contrast, I should be adding a dark or a contrast. Nicola, who does most of the sewing on these, does them in groups of four. Don't know how she does. I would get completely confused, but she has a technique where she lines up four complete sets, sticks a pin in the first one to show that that's the first one in the sequence, and just rattles away. So she has the other set of 28 off home with her. And she'll probably win the race again. She'll turn up one of these days with all 28 made when I'm still struggling. But, hey ho. Either way, we'll have them all made between the two of us. In time for next week. And that is yet another advantage of this method. If you have a group that wants to make a group cut, because these are pre-cut, you can hand them out to as many different people as you want, and they should all come back the same size. Unless people have gone so drastically wrong. Which I'm trying not to do here. This is one of the reasons why so many cutters prefer to always work in pure cotton. Because pure cotton does what it's told. If you were trying to finger press 
man-made fibres. Man-made fibres are designed not to take a piece. Not to need ironing. These fabrics, when you press them, they stay pressed. And that's why cotton is the fabric of choice for most people. And not just any cotton either. Seams are going. The direction of the seams can make a huge difference. I would never sew that way because I can't see what's happening underneath here when I'm sewing. I'm always sewing this way. Then I can see this has to flip that way, but this one also has to flip this way. If you sew the other way around with the detail that's hidden underneath, you can't see that. And you're going to make mistakes. Always check as well, these little white on white prints are very subtle and you need to check, preferably in good light, that you're not using the wrong side because it can be very difficult to spot. Until the quilt is finished, that is, and then you do it and then to annoy you for the rest of your life. If anything really bugs you, go back and redo it. If it's not going to bug you, only on the text then absolutely necessary. You can adapt this method to use with bigger blocks and smaller blocks. You can adapt it to use in a uniform log cabin where the blocks are just made from one light fabric and one contrast fabric with the centre. Or what I call formal log cabin where you have specific fabrics chosen to be in each location repeating throughout your quilt. But my own personal favourite is this one, the scrappy one, because it just looks like old fashioned picture.
No steam. The only time I use steam is if I've got very creased fabric to press it before I start to work with it, before I start to cut it to get the creases out. But I don't use steam at this stage because it can distort the fabric and you can also get some very nasty burns because you have to have your fingers very close to the source of the steam. So that's the two blocks that I've just made. Those opposite each other. Those are two blocks from yesterday. And so next week we can start to combine those and make all kinds of patterns. But before I go, what I'm going to do is show you one more time how the cutting process works. So those are our completed blocks made using this combination of fabrics. I could have used my blues combined with creams. I could have used greens combined with whites. I could have used the darks combined with the lights from this group. Same from that group. Or I could go to my own stash of fabrics and any fat quarters that I have that I am able to use up, I can use the elements of the sizes that I've described create these log cabin lasagna slices. So one more time where to look at them. All the bits that I need were here. Just a matter of sorting them into sequence. The biggest one is down. And the next. And if you get one wrong, you'll spot it because there's just an inch of a difference each time. Ten steps and stairs like that. Four. And of course, the lights here are all one uniform fabric, but the lights could be all mixed the way the other one is mixed. So it's my six layers dark or contrast in case a six layers of light first one of which is hidden in there, in the midst of the layers, attached to the centerpiece. All the elements, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, double check that they're all there. You don't want to do all these slices and find you with one bit missing. That's very sad. Rotary cutter, here. Big block of a book or any other width that you need to keep it in place. Start again. And cut. One and a half inch slices. I have another pattern where the slices are two inches deep. Just gives you bigger size blocks. If you need to make a cut in a hurry, go for the bigger blocks. We have a third pattern where the blocks are even tinier. They're just over five inches square. And if you want something very, very detailed, quite small, or blocks to use within 
small sample cut type blocks go for the even smaller ones but this is a really nice size block to make a double bed cut you want to make a hundred of these blocks will give you 70 inches square of patchwork 144 of these blocks will give you 84 inches square of patchwork that's patchwork before you add on your borders somebody else can do the sums after that 14 by 14 too big for my head just keep the weight in place this is the stage where they can begin to come adrift. but having the ones on the outside. Each group will have a different formation. So this group, while all the elements are the same, they will occur in different places. So they will maintain that kind of appearance of randomness. But by having your fabrics turned this way up, you can identify which one you're sewing, choosing to sew. And that is my one small handful of wasted time. And that's right.